Hi, welcome to the PowerPoint about George Washington Carver and Henry Ford. I'm really thankful that you're here. Uh, I think this will show us a little different side of Henry Ford and I was excited to explore it. I did a lot of uh, reading and research on him. And the most important thing that I need to do is share my screen with you so you can see the PowerPoint. And here we go. Uh, I wanted to explain one of the reasons I was interested in this is because when I was a teenager, my mother did a paper to keep her teaching certification on George Washington Carver and she was really inspired by him. And I thought that you might find him inspirational as well. So this is a tribute to my, for you, mom. The greatest of all my inspiring friends exploring the friendship of Henry Ford and George Washington Carver. And interestingly enough, that quote that is from Thomas Edison. George Washington Carver was an agricultural scientist and inventor who developed hundreds of products using peanuts. You probably have heard of that. He's known as the peanut man, sweet potatoes, and even soybeans when he starts associating with Henry Ford. His life began on a home established by Moses Carver near Diamond Grove, Missouri. Moses Carver was a slave owner at that time and he purchased George's mother, Mary, in 1855. George gives, is born to Mary somewhere in the early 1860s to 1865. There is no exact date on his birth. Some people think it was in the early 1860s. Some say 1864. That's what I saw the most common. And so they say it makes a difference because if it was earlier, then he was born into slavery, though in eight, by 1864, slavery was outlawed. But no matter what, I think the point is that George Washington Cairo was born into a world of slavery because his mother was a slave. Uh, Moses built a cabin for his family that later becomes Mary's home and a new cabin was constructed nearby in 1860, just to give you an idea, because there is a place that you can visit today before a, plant, a frame plantation home was erected further away around 1890. This is really sad. When George was about six weeks old, a gang of night riders kidnapped him and his mother. Moses sent a rescue party after them, but very tragically, they only recovered George. Uh, by this point, George is no longer supposedly a slave. I think it depends on when he was born, but eventually either way, Carver will free them. Mo Very complicated time Mo and, and a horrible time in our nation's history with slavery. But for some reason, it appears as though Carver has a change of heart, but because he welcomes them and his brothers, his older brother James into the family and provides him with an education. But remember, his mother was a slave and most likely he was born into slavery. So that is going to shape his life and shape what he is and isn't able to do as a black American. George was frequently sick and spent much of his time helping Mrs. Carver, Susan Carver with chores around the cabin. He learned many domestic skills such as cooking, mending, and doing laundry. He also tended the garden and became fascinated with plants. And this is just to fill you in on both Carver and Ford. I'll get to the good stuff where they meet up and become friends. Uh, so she taught him to read and write at a time where black Americans typically were not allowed to be. And when he was 11, George will move 10 miles away to attend a school for African Americans because there was nothing closer by. He stayed there for at least two years until the late 1870s when he decided to move to Kansas with others who were traveling west. And if you're wondering what that is, that is a picture of the national, what they call it a national monument, the site for Carver. And that is a sculptor, sculpture of Carver as a young boy. 
Over the next 10 years, George traveled from one Western town to another, working and attending school. He often used his domestic skills to make money. By the late 1880s, George moved to Iowa, where he enrolled in Simpson College, and he studied piano and art. And he was a brilliant musician and a very good artist, particularly of botanicals. But after a year, he transferred to the State Agricultural College at Ames, Iowa, because he wanted to follow his passion and his interest in agriculture. He earned his bachelor's degree in botany in 1894 and later a master's degree in 1896 and realized he would have had tremendous obstacles that he had to overcome along the way. Uh, this is a little redundant, but I wanted to show you this picture of him when he's getting his bachelor's degree, I believe, and this is when he's about 30 years old. Uh, he does attend Simpson College to study music and art, and then transfer to o Iowa State, and where he gets his two degrees. And it, what I thought was really interesting at the time, he was the only African American with an advanced degree in agricultural science. On October 8th, 1896, he will join Tuskegee Institute staff as the Director of Agriculture. In May of 1906, he initiated the Jessup Wagon, which is with someone else named Thomas Monroe Campbell. Well, what was the Jessup Wagon? The name doesn't tell you much, but it later is going to become known as the Movable School Bus. But he would go into the surrounding communities and teach the very four parts poor farmers about nutrition, proper hygiene, crop rotation, and what's uh, really interesting, even home decor. So he reached out to people in the depths of poverty. I love this painting. It's of him when he's older. Uh, he always ex interested in plants and he excelled at painting them. His art teacher, Edda Budd, encouraged him to enter one of his paintings this is when he was at his first college and a local exhibit and where he was selected of one of, as one of the artists um, artworks to represent Iowa at the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. And coincidentally, by the way, Thomas Edison will have something to do with that uh, World's Fair in Chicago. And there's a story I didn't put in here, but I'll to add that um, Thomas Edison does offer Carver a job uh, he turns him down, but I also thought that was an interesting connection because, you know, Edison and Ford were good friends. Carver's painting, Yucca and Cactus, got an honorable mention at the fair. And I can't remember if I bring this up later on, but of all his artworks that were known to exist, there was a fire, I believe, at the national site. And of the 47 pieces of art, there's only three left. There also is talk about some being displayed elsewhere. So I don't know if there's any more out there or not. I tried to find out, but I didn't have a lot of answers, but it's something I'm gonna look into. In 1896, the very famous man, Booker T. Washington, who founded Tuskegee Institute, offered him a position as the head of the Department of Agriculture at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. During his 47 years there, Carver educated farmers on conservation, organic farming, and sustainable agricultural practices. Crop rotation was an integral, was integral at this plus addressing the depletion of soil fertility in the rural South because they over depended on cotton and cotton just leached everything out of the soil. So he was trying to get them interested in growing other things and rotating where the things were grown so that the soil wasn't completely depleted. And of all the things he did, I think this is one of his greater accomplishments. And I'll tell you what I think his other one is later on. Uh, Southern farmers began growing alternative nitrogen fixing crops like sweet potatoes and peanuts. Carver also received patents on several industrial applications of common crops. He invented over 300 uses of the peanuts. Some people say some of those ideas were already out there, but he looked at using materials in different ways. And he also had a hundred for the sweet potato as well. Obviously those are not in effect today. Maybe I think they read there were perhaps three that were left. And this is him with the 
faculty of Tuskegee Institute at the time. That is him in the front row, center. Let's talk a little bit about Henry Ford and we're gonna to get to where they meet up pretty soon. And by the way, if you have questions, I will be happy to an answer them at the end of the presentation. Henry Ford was born in 1863 on a farm near Dearborn, Michigan. From an early age, he expressed an interest in mechanical devices. And by the way, his mother died when he was quite young in childbirth and that devastated him. He had the equivalent of about a seventh grade education. He left the family farm to seek employment in Detroit. He had met a young woman named Clara Jane Bryant and they had one son they named Edsel. He works his way up to chief engineer at the Edison Illuminating Company. So great, and where he meets actually Thomas Edison who encourages him is on his work on the gas powered automobile. He uh, leaves Edison Illuminating Company to form his own automobile company. And he had two failed companies, which uh, talks about the need to persevere because he found success with the Ford Motor Company and developed the Model T in 1908 and the assembly line for automobiles in 1913 that made cars more affordable. In 1896, Henry Ford attended the convention of the um, association, and that's where I mentioned where Ford gives him a few words of, he gave Ford a few words of encouragement, Thomas Edison, to keep at it. They'll go on to develop a deep friendship, and in 1914, the Ford family first visit the Edisons down here in Fort Myers. He purchases the property next door known as the Mangos in 1816, Craftsman Bungalow Home, and it was also the start of some camping trips. They had a pretty wild camping trip. Uh, at that point, Harvey Firestone wasn't there, but Edison and Ford and Burroughs and their families. And uh, this will go on to be the renowned camping trips that I spoke about a few months back. Uh, again, I'm mentioning when they, he marries Clara Jane Bryant, they had one son, Edsel Ford, who happens to be my personal hero. Edsel succeeded his father as president of Ford Motor Company in 1919, and he held that position till his death. Very tragically, he died in 1943 from stomach cancer. Henry Ford returns to the post, and he resigns the presidency under pressure because he just was not able to perform the duties. And he recommended that his grandson uh, take over. He comes back from the war takes over Ford Motor Company and Ford, um, Henry Ford died unexpectedly at his home Fair Lane in Dearborn on April 7th, 1947, following a cerebral hemorrhage. He was 83 years old. Beginning, in, and this was where we'll get up to pretty soon to speed to where they meet up. Beginning in 1842, soybeans consumed Henry Ford's attention. He grew them on his farm in Dearborn and wanted to study the 3,000 types of soybeans. So this is what's interesting to me. Henry Ford, who really wanted to leave the farm, is now developing an interest in agriculture and the uses of crops. He wanted to study three, did you, who knew there were 3,000 types of soybeans? He extracted soybean oil at his Greenfield Village laboratory and use it to make all kinds of things like enamels, varnish, and other goods. This is the part I don't think I'd enjoy. He served soybean meals at his home and I like soybean in moderation. Uh, he had celery stuff with soybean. He had cheese made out of soybean. He had apple pie with soybean sauce. We've had the soybean cookies here before on Henry Ford's birthday. And he also created his own version of tofu. Working with a Ford engineer, he designed the first soy plastic car made with soybean and hemp. And what also is interesting to me is that they talk about Henry Ford hitting a soybean car with a plastic insert on the back to protect it as well. And so that really wasn't his soybean car that you'll see him hitting, by the way. Here we go. Ford and Carver began a correspondence in 1934 in which Ford laid out his goals to have body materials, paint, and even engine fuels derived from those farming staples. 
Carver laid out his agreement in his letters and suggested possible uses of plants for automotive materials. Of the six years, they shared many visits and letters. And there's Carver and Ford there. In 1937, when both Carver and Ford were in their early 70s, they met in person for the first time. At Ford's invitation, Carver traveled to Michigan to tour his factories and discuss their shared interests. And this is when they're well into their 70s. There's George Washington Carver on the left, Henry Ford on the right. And they, in those letters, they uh, developed a close bond and they also did so in person. They had many common interests. Carver goes to tour some of Ford's factories as well. And spends quite a bit of time in Michigan. In 1939, and that's a sign for the George Washington Carver School that Henry Ford will dedicate to George Washington Carver on his plantation known as Richmond Hill, his estate. In 1939, he will build a school to serve the educational needs of the African-American children um, of that in the area that's called Lower Bryan County, and that's in Georgia. The school opened later that year with grades one through six, and Ford named the school in honor of George Washington Carver. Carver would actually go to this area. It's in Bryan County. The area, the home is called Richmond Hill and he names it in honor of him. And Carver spends time there at Ford's pl plantation there growing crops, helping to oversee thousands of acres of crops and attend the dedication of the school. And it was, as I said, it was named in his honor. He's coming up with ideas there in Georgia and also will frequently go to Michigan with his ideas. So he did a multitude of things. And you might recognize this picture because it is what I'm sitting in front of. And that is Richmond Hill because Carver spent a lot of time there at the, uh, the plantation there. And I do believe there's a historical society that oversees it, but I do believe it's a private home, but there is a, before the pandemic, at least there was a way to meet up with somebody. So maybe that you could get a specialty tour, uh, but Back to George Washington Carver, he's, he and his students often visited Ford's home and his experimental farm at Richmond Hill in Georgia. Ford helped Carver to achieve the recognition he deserved as a scientist. And in 1941, Henry and Clara came to Tuskegee Institute to dedicate the opening of his museum. They inscribed their names in the cornerstone and brought soybean car parts to be included. So there is a museum there at Tuskegee. It's an institute. It will go on to become a university as well. And Carver would go down there frequently, spend time, work with the people that were there, work on rotating the crops and work on working with Henry Ford as well. This was interesting to me and I did borrow this from the Henry Ford Museum. And George Washington Carver was carried away when he was six years old. He was returned, but there wasn't a lot left of the home that he originally was grew up in. And Henry Ford had this recreated for him, a replica of Carver's birthplace in Greenfield Village. And I've only been to Greenfield Village once, but uh, it's an enlightening experience. You can go there and see that cottage to give you a feel of what George Washington Carver grew up with at the time. Where else can you visit? Well, right now, from what I can see, uh, there, is, there is a couple places and I'll mention them later on, but Tuskegee Institute is actually a historic part of it. It's a museum now, and it's part of the greater Tuskegee University. And right now it's been closed because of COVID from March of 2020 to the present, you haven't been able to visit it in person, but go and see that there's things to do with Henry Ford and George Washington Carver at Greenfield Village. Well, in 1942, Henry Ford also named a Ford Motor Company Nutrition Laboratory after George Washington Carver. 
let's talk a little bit more about this. He had dedicated his career to experimental agriculture to, and improving nutrition and health as well as the yield of the crops. And remember, he's a believer in the rotating crops. Uh, Ford would do anything for him. There was a greenhouse and an experimental kitchen. And George Washington Carver by this time is becoming gradually more frail. Though frail, Carver traveled to Dearborn for the dedication. And Etzel Ford also happened to be present there. George Washington Carver and Henry Ford not only shared an interest in usually using agricultural products and in industry, Shemergy, but also some unusual ideas about diet. And you thought Thomas Edison had the unusual ideas with the milk diet. Well, they both were in a had a great idea about using weeds to as food and to use the spread of those weeds to for nutrition and agriculture. Uh, this picture here, Carver and Ford are sharing a sandwich, which was made out of weeds, as Carver defines it. It's called the weed spread made with things like narrowed leaf plantain, purslane, pigweed, milkweed, who knew? Dandelion, I knew about dandelion greens, lamb's quarters, and that's a weed, it's not a real lamb, and wild radish. George Washington Carver arrived in Dearborn on July 19th, 1942 to join Henry Ford for a series of experiments. So I realized they're not just researching agriculture and food that can be eaten that are deemed to be weeds, but he's also working on other experiments, some that were set up in a lab space and a workspace in Dearborn in a building that once held waterworks. And they tested a number of plants in the hope of producing a rubber substitute. Does this sound familiar to you that we've talked about rubber substitutes and who had that idea before? Uh, I think it will, you'll remember it's Edison, Ford and Firestone in their laboratory that has that idea of producing a substitute for rubber. So they're gonna want something that will make the, and that lot will be made of. It's not gonna be synthetic. And uh, why are they still experimenting? Didn't that even get all solved? Let's look at this. He arrives there, he does the experiments. They set up a workspace and a laboratory there and they tested the plants with the hope of producing a rubber substitute to assist with the war effort. And this is during World War II. They tried out everything from soybean. Remember, this is a favorite of Ford's soybean, sweet potatoes, dandelions, but they go to goldenrod. So think about this. Um, they had, Edison had done experiments with 17,000 different types of plants, you no, know, told to produce latex rubber. And they would continue to work on that. Some places we are told at Richmond Hill, they continue to work on it. But you remember that reading that eventually after Edison had passed away, that there was success that his workers, Edison's workers were able to produce latex from giant goldenrod. Oh, right here, we're reading about it again, what happened? Well, I think what happened is that, this is my educated uh, guess as best as close as I can get, is that Edison uh, does have success. He is on his deathbed, they continue working. And you can make rubber from goldenrod. Personally, I haven't done so, but it is possible to do so. But that is for in the event of a war, another emergency. And so then Ford has Carver researching things he could make latex from, such as dandelion, sweet potatoes, and goldenrod. So Carver experiments it with goldenrod and Edison and his workers experiment with goldenrod as well. And I never really realized that that work by Carver and Ford uh, was continuing continuing on the legacy of Edison, along with help from Ford and Firestone to produce latex from objects that one wouldn't commonly think, such as goldenrod. And there they are in the laboratory there that Ford made for Carver and they are eating weed spread to make a sandwich. Hmm. I'll let you decide if it looks appetizing or not.
uh, the friendship to me is very touching. It says, Carver writes to Ford, and that's Henry Ford on the left. They're in their 70s. George Washington Carver on the right. And those letters go back and forth. He even writes to Clara Ford as well, George Washington Carver. He becomes very close to the family, but it's over a more limited period of time than Thomas Edison was friends with Carver very briefly offering the job. And then of course, Edison is friends with Ford and that goes on much longer. But Carver and Ford um, form an unbreakable bond. And Carver writes to Ford, two of the greatest things that have ever come into my life have happened this year. The first was the meeting of you and to see the great educational project that you are carrying on in a way I have never seen demonstrated before. And there they are again. And very great praise from George Washington Carver to Ford. He even will put in an elevator because it was very hard as for um, Carver gets older for him to go up and down stairs. So that's gonna offer him great protection. And here we have Henry F Ford and one of his workers says to him, I think basically, I think Edison is the greatest man alive. And this is what Henry Ford says back. I'm quoting Henry Ford. And this is about Edison. I don't know. He was a great man, all right. But I think that Carver was really a greater man than Edison was. I found that so amazing. And their friendship, I believe, lasts like nine or so years. We were talking years upon years with uh, Edison and Ford. And each, obviously, each friendship was special in its own way. Here's a picture that really uh, spoke to me. This is Tuskegee Institute, and it's actually a panoramic and I can't fit it all on here. And it's not the modern view from today, but the view that would have been what George Washington Carver would have visited. So right now there is Tuskegee University. There is a place to visit um, when things are going well called uh, Tuskegee Institute. And that is open as like a museum to the public on the greater campus of Tuskegee University. But as I said, it hasn't been open since last March. I would really like to go there to Alabama, to Tuskegee, Alabama, and check this out. And also visit Missouri, Mississippi, excuse me, where George Washington Carver was born and that national monument that to him is there. little more information about the two men. Carver was died on January 5th, 1943 at Tuskegee Institute. And look at the length of his career, the people that he collaborated with as well. After falling down the stairs of his home, and I'm not sure why he used that instead of the elevator that Ford uh, put in there for him for his protection. And I'm, I got up here, he was about 79 years old. Remember, he's born a slave. We're never gonna know his exact date. So he could have been 80, 81, 82. So late 70s, early 80s, um, he had become quite frail. He was buried next to Booker T. Washington on the Tuskegee Institute grounds in 1941. And by the way, Washington is the one that invites him to join the staff. They kind of had a relationship with its up and downs, but they did greatly admire each other and they're um, two of the gentlemen that really contributed to the history of George Washington Carver. In 1941, the George Washington Carver Museum opened on the campus of the Tuskegee Institute. The museum displayed paintings and I'm interested in that because there was a fire at his national um, monument and I only left a few of his paintings, but here we're talking about them being displayed in the museum at Tuskegee Institute. They just displayed paintings, knittings, experiments and crops by Carver. He had a lot of skill, a domestic skill, obviously educational. Chemergy, if I'm saying that right, all that comes from him. Um, he just, 
expanded the mind and had so many different ideas about so many different things that I would love to be able to visit this. Carver passed away on January 5th, 1943 at the age of 79. I repeated myself there, but it's really 79, 80, 81. His something like that, his entire state of over $60,000. Realize how long ago that was, and he was a professor. He was not a wealthy man, but it was bequeathed to the George Washington Carver Foundation, which continues his work today. A national monument was just constructed in 1943 at his childhood home in Diamond, Missouri. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt made a donation of $30,000 towards its construction. And there is a picture out there of Carver and Roosevelt together. He was even friends, by the way. Carver is friends with Gandhi as well. This is tragic when any piece of history is lost. A fire at the monument destroyed all but three of Carver's 48 paintings there in 1947. Here is his epitaph. I would love to visit and play tribute to him. It said, he could have added fortune to fame, but caring for neither, he found happiness and honor in being helpful to the world. And I believe he was. Today, people look at him with a pretty critical eye, but realize what a trailblazer he was for other Black Americans. Um, do a lot of his patents have practical application today? I don't know, but it gave the idea of crop rotation. And he did explore other uses for the peanut, and maybe that wasn't his greatest idea, but it was certainly one of them. Um, here are a few of my sources. Um, I used a History Daily, the biography website, Auto Channel, the Henry Ford. They have a lot. There's even a cat picture of a cast that was done of Carver's hand that Ford had. So there's a, they're a great site to visit. National Public Radio had a presentation on him. Uh, just numerous pages, a page about Tuskegee and Ford Motor Company. And then a few books, The Green Vision of Henry Ford and George Washington Carver, The People's Tycoon, Henry Ford and the American Century. And this book is out of print, but it is one of my favorites. And it is Wheels for the World, Henry Ford is Company in the Century of Progress. And then a, it, actually a children's book called George Washington Carver by Charles Carey Jr. Just a couple of things and I will get to your questions. I thank you for your patience. I'm kind of slumping here. Uh, this is our address, Edison Ford Winter Estates. Uh, if you ever would like to send a donation, these are all free and um, optional, but we do appreciate your support. We hope you will visit our website and sign up for other ones. We hope you'll come for a tour, become a member, or if you just have anything you'd like to share with us, there's our address 2350 McGregor Boulevard, Fort Myers 33901. If you want a link, because we will have this Zoom meeting uh, uploaded to YouTube later today. Uh, if you want a link to that, I can send it to you or you can look for it. Or if you have anything you wanna email me about or suggestions you have about anything, uh, please feel free. My email is hshafer, S-H-A-F-F-E-R, at edisonford.org. And our next digital discussion is on Florida in the Civil War. It's on June 8th at 2021, 1030 in the morning. One of my deep interest is the Civil War. I used to volunteer before I came to Edison Ford, starting my 16th year here at a museum in Maine about a Civil War general. Uh, I think Florida's role in the Civil War is overlooked and the supplies that they uh, gave during the Civil War. So we hope you'll join us and that's the end of my slideshow. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, but I'm gonna to continue to talk. It looks like I have a few questions, so let me check it out. Oh, thank you. Is it possible to get a letter or a certificate in, of attendance? 
Absolutely. I will make sure that you do that. Uh, just email me and I can do something about that. You have my email address and I'd be happy uh, to say that you listen to this. And thank you for saying it. it's a great resource. I really was inspired by George Washington Carver. I wish I could actually pick up <laughs> my mother's, uh, I wish I had my mother's paper she wrote on him because she was so inspired by him as well. So please don't hesitate to email me. Um, there's some chats here, I just wanna check. I thank you so much, thanks. Oh, I have a comment here that George Washington Carver was selfless. He turned down big money from agricultural business to continue his work at Tuskegee, which is true. I, I, I thank you for listening to my presentations. I really feel strongly and passionately about him. And I liked, this isn't the typical side that I usually see of Henry Ford. And I saw that tender side. So that's it for this time. I hope you'll join me on June 8th, Florida in the Civil War. Did you know there was a battle of Fort Myers? Most people don't. Please uh, tune in for that. There's so much more that you probably don't know about the Civil War. It's a big topic, but I'm gonna talk about the biggest Civil War battle. There was Olusti, the one in, biggest in Florida and uh, New Hampshire troops were there and that's where I'm from. But spread the word about George Washington Carver and Henry Ford and join me next month. And thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate you all. And I hope to see you and email me with any questions or concerns. Thanks, bye-bye.